feeling like there's this kind of money on the line and the evaluation that's made it happen. So just, you know, as a totally full disclaimer, um, you know, my first complete sentence is the worker is always right. The idea of having a capitalist approach to doing this was, you know, not something that I immediately warmed up to. Um, I believe in big government. I think it's government's job to provide interventions like this. Um, however, our government isn't providing these interventions. And so the idea of trying some new way of financing this um, has, was attractive to us. Great. And we're enjoying it. I'm gonna ask you a couple of quick things just before we get to Kimora, just to overview. How many, you probably said so, but again, how many kids are? 3,000 a year for three years. For so three we'll years. Be, it, we'll be inter intervening right. uh, with 9,000 young people. And the nine? Point six, nine point six million is is is, is that's we, we don't actually see, see all that right. We get seven point four million dollars right. over I think something like that, two and a half million dollars a year. Um, it's not enough, and it's a limited intervention. If somebody had involved us much earlier, I would have had a lot to say about why this intervention, bought in and of itself by itself, is the only thing we can do. Right, but. But we are, uh, you know, I, as I explained to them early on when they said just do this, I said I don't have people on my staff that are going to ignore a kid living in a car. Right, right, okay, good. And, and how many? Sorry, how many staff did, did you have? Did you hire with this? Uh, I think we have twenty-two facilitators. Twenty-two with three thousand. Right. Uh, the, the the intervention has requires a uh, one a, one facilitator per seven kids as a requirement. So in order to do that, you need a lot of them. Got it. So in three years, right? Just to get... Um, it's 10 weeks, that way. It's a 10 week. Well, you're, doing, you're not doing 3,000 kids at once. Right. No, you're, you're not. There's about, the population's the about 500 on a given day. They're not all in school on a given day. It's in the school. Um, their average length of stay is actually 23 days because these are detainees. Some are there long enough to do the whole program. Right. And the ones who aren't are supposed to come to our uh, they come to the community to complete it, and then we subcontracted with another nonprofit that has more youth programming in the community. I'm sorry, and the last thing is, when do you decide and when it, whether it's worked or not? When do we decide? When is, when is, it, who, when is it decided? Whether, how long, what, what point, three years from now? Well, if or? my staff hasn't all quit by J December, I'm gonna call it a complete success. Right, but <laughs> no, I mean, whether Zero. or not Goldman gets paid. Or. Zero is going to, is collecting all the data over this year, and right. I believe two years later they will, because they're gonna follow the kids that are in this year for two years. Right, got So it. three years from now, well, I'll come back and let you know. And, and that's when the contract would be? No, actually, we, we know we, our term is five years, but in three years we'll have our first data set. Good, great. And what's the reduction in recidivism? They want, the percentage, right? 20% is, is our goal, but I believe that then there's a sliding scale for what the payoff is anywhere between 20 and 10%. 10 is the, the, 10 is the, the base case, the bottom. So 10% so we get our money back. There's no payoff. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. You fall off a cliff, which is also sort of a funky structuring thing, which you wouldn't normally do. Right. 47%. And I guess the, it'll be measured against a control group. That Recidivism someone being defined as going back to jail, not an arrest. Within one, uh, within within one year, two years, two years, two years, and it's days and it's days again. Yeah. Uh, it's not just forty-seven percent. No, it's it's ten percent of, of the forty-seven. Okay, it has to be enough that they can close an entire housing unit because because reducing smaller amounts is marginal cost that doesn't save. Ten million dollars or whatever they're going for here. So, and, and, and I missed it. When you say ten percent, is it is the difference of ten percent between the control group and the ten group? There's not a control group that, that there was supposed to be a control group. Ah, my, my and, bad. And DOC couldn't control the control group because <laughs> kids kept just going into whatever classroom. If, if you've ever been on Rikers Island, this will come as no big surprise to you. But they literally could not separate the groups in a, in a reasonable way. So Vera redesigned it to compare this year's cohort to two previous years that they're gonna to have to match it up against. And so the recidivism rate is 10 percentage points lower than it used to be. That's, 
then that will be a success. All right, great. Mm -hmm. I'm going for 20. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Tomorrow. Maybe because people. I want Goldman to get every single as, dime. That's right. That's right. As, as do we all. Right. Uh, Question here before we go to sure. Kamara. Can you break down what the, um, the interest is depending on the rate of the drop? I bet that's at least you can. Yeah, I agree. Um, bill or, uh, it actually doesn't, the, the way the note is structured is not actually based on actual interest. What we did was we have a schedule of if 11 percent this is all this is all transparent it was in the press release um you know sort of sketched down right so at 10 percent we get our 9.6 million at 13 percent we get 10 million 368,000 i mean it's really de minimis interest um and what we did do which is unusual and i don't think would be where the market is going to go is we capped our um our our, our maximum payment um, at 11.7 million against the 9.6, and that's at a 20%. So every dollar above that, the city gets all the savings, right? Which is also, again, I doubt where the market is going to go ultimately if these things become more commonplace. So every dime above that amount that we're taking um, at the 20% goes to the city. <coughs> so it's not truly, I mean, it's not the way an instru a typical instrument would not work that way. 20% meaning 20% reduced. Yeah, so then if it's 25% reduced, they save all that extra money. We don't get a piece of that savings. <coughs> Great, we good on the basic outline. Good, good, good. Uh, Kamara, good job. As a practitioner and uh, about uh, how you see all this. Okay. Thank you. And I, I, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. And uh, I want to thank the Center for um, uh, Media, Crime and Justice and, and uh, Mr. Starkman for having us and Steve Handelman for having us this afternoon. Uh, why is cognitive skills education so important and part of all of this? Well, if you look at the sheet that I've handed out, I think most of you have it. We really need to understand that cognitive skills education is really an important part of education that actually can reach those who have been in prison or in jail. I will not, by the way, refer to them as inmates. We call them participants, so out of respect for them. But if you look at cognitive skills research, you can look at many different aspects, but there's some basic components to it that actually much of the American public really doesn't understand very well in terms of their own behavior during, during their lifetime. Uh, for example, problem solving skills are crucial. And people who have been serving some time in prison or jail uh, who have been arrested have, uh, in many cases, very little understanding between the difference between a problem and a, and, and a solution. So this is crucial for them to learn. Second part of cognitive skills oftentimes is what we call social skills. And these people are out to lunch when it comes to that, not, not figuratively or whatever, but the point is, is that they don't know how to function when somebody gets upset with them. They think that, you know, perhaps I'm just gonna start a fight if I can't get what I want. So we can teach them how to actually uh, solve a problem in a civil manner in a social setting. Another third aspect of cognitive skills education that's universally used throughout the world is uh, just the dealing with the fact that people get angry. So how do you, how do you deal with anger management? How do, you, how do you get somebody to calm down? How do you recognize what causes anger for a person? Many people in this country are chronically depressed. They don't even understand that anger is at the core of depression. So this is a very complicated issue, particularly when you're dealing with people who have, have been abused, traumatized in life. Fourth kind of basic kind of cognitive skills education is creativity. Many people do not recognize that they are extremely creative. So if you take a, a program like moral recognition therapy, which is used, uh, which is also called MRT, one of the first things that's asked of the participant is to map out what was going on in their life a year ago, five years ago, and 10 years ago that put them where they're at. In, and also, what could have happened a year ago, five years ago, or 10 years ago that could have put them on a different path where they were not causing harm to themselves and others. And a fifth aspect, and what I consider one of the most important, crucial parts of cognitive skills education is critical thinking. And critical thinking, as you may know, does not mean we're going to be negative about something, but we're actually going to teach people how to be leaders. The Foundation for Critical Thinking, for example, has amazing work that basically deciphers three different categories of critical thinkers in this country and in the world. One are those that are completely uncritical, the uncritical person, who basically is not interested in learning anything, 
or does not know the importance of learning. So therefore, even though they're very naive and they kind of walk through life like that, they have good hearts, but they're easily deceived and manipulated and indoctrinated by a second category of people called self-serving critical thinkers. And those people know just a little bit more than somebody else about something, so they know how to pull the wool over somebody and cause problems. Third kind of critical thinker is the fair-minded critical thinker. This is what we want the participants to be. We want participants to love learning, to be open-minded, to be logical, to be uh, honest about what's going on in their lives, so they want to change, and to treat themselves and others with respect. That is the goal, in our minds, of cognitive skills education. Now, if you look at the, uh, I'm not gonna cite the study per se, because I don't wanna embarrass anybody in this room, but I wanna point out to you just briefly why critical thinking skills is such an important part of cognitive skills. It's something that we emphasize quite a bit. About five years ago, there was a study done in a series of high schools in one state in this country that we'll, rename, we'll keep anonymous. And the question was asked of every single high school teacher, uh, do you think that all of your students need to learn critical thinking skills? And virtually every single teacher said what, do you think? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Second question, what are critical thinking skills? <laughs> do you know that 98% of those high school teachers did not know the answer to that question? So, what this proves, among many things, is that it's really important for people to understand that cognitive skills is really important, critical thinking is very important. Critical thinking is so important if we are to understand that many of the people that have served time or have been detained are actually leaders. They are born leaders, so you can debate that all you want. I've seen enough of it during the 23 years of work that I've done as an educator in prisons and jails to know that much of the leadership of the planet is there, it needs to be developed, it is vital. In 2008, the Pew Institute came out with an interesting study. It was mentioned in the February 28th issue of the New York Times. The article was called, One in 100 U.S. Adults Are Behind Bars. There's no excuse, as far as we're concerned in this country, for people to not be educated. It is vital that people learn these basic forms of cognitive skills that I've just outlined. If you look at the sheet that I handed out to you at the bottom, I list several different types of cognitive skills training programs that I have worked with. I'll briefly tell you about them. Number one is Reasoning and Rehabilitation. It's a program from the Correctional Service of Canada, authored by Porporino. You can email me later if you have more questions about that. It's wonderful and some of the cultural differences don't fit what we're doing here in this country, but it's amazing work. It's groundbreaking work in cognitive skills. Number two is Going Out by Going In, GOGI program. That was actually written by people who are incarcerated, uh, male uh, participants at the time, and Mara Lee Taylor picked it up, wrote a series of three books in that area, and she uses it extensively in prisons and jails in Utah and California, and it is absolutely amazing to see the self-esteem in the people uh, changing. And as a result, when these people are in the pods, the corrections officers say, wow, my day is easy. I don't have to deal with some, nearly as many problems because people are doing the things we've been talking about. Third is Breaking Barriers. Breaking Barriers was written by a gentleman named Gordon Graham, who I personally know, who was incarcerated for over two decades in a, um, a prison in Washington and other areas. Finally, he realized, you know what? I need to change the way I'm doing something here. This is not working for me. I'm gonna write about what I know other people need to know, and it is used by uh, the Osborne Association. I've used it for about eight years now with clients in the Bronx. The last one is Moral Recognition Therapy, MRT, which is the program that um, Liz Gaines was just mentioning, and it's part of the specific program that we're using at, at uh, Rikers. Great, fantastic. Um, I have um, questions occurred to me, so I'm gonna ask one of each of the panelists, actually in the same order, but again, <coughs> we're all friends here. <laughs> Feel free to speak up. But one thing that did occur to me, almost the first thing I thought about when I heard about this is, okay, um, the things that Kimura were talking about are, you know, I, I'm gonna take her, at her word, I assume they're extremely valuable. The question is, what do we need um, this layer of complexity and uh, expense that comes from this particular financing mechanism. So the question is, how is it, how come, why is it, the, is it not the, why can't the state itself, the city, um, 
assess the risks, risks, make the same kind of evaluation that Goldman here does, or any other potential investor in the in the social impact loan, I guess we'll call it. Why is it that the private sector would be better at this than the state, given that the state could do it um, a lot more simply and a lot more cheaply? See what I'm saying? Yeah, please. Well, I don't, I don't think that's, well, I, I sort of wish that Linda Gibbs or somebody from the city were here because I don't think that, not that we can do it better than they can, that's not even the issue. The issue is they're not doing it. They don't have any extra money to spend on programs that they believe are important um, programs and services to provide to, to their citizens. They make the choice, right? The Department of Corrections and the administration made the choice that this particular um, intervention was going to have the results that they were seeking as a public policy matter, um, correctly wanting to do everything they possibly could to reduce the rate of recidivism for all the right reasons, in addition to the cost savings, and then at the end of the day, if you've noticed, it's not like city budgets have been going up, city right. budgets have been going down. So if you are the budget director of a city and you don't have a lot of money uh, to come up with programs that, by the way, are discretionary, not entitlement programs, you are trying to be a creative person and figure out how you can identify other sources. And that could be philanthropy, or in this case, taking it to the next level and saying, are there private sector solutions which we can harness in order to deliver the services that we want to, but unless we raise taxes, we're not gonna be able to do it. Right. So, so I can't do it better, I just have the money and they don't. Got it, and is, is there, is it, is it literally true that there's no like capital budget for this kind of thing? In, well, it wouldn't be in, capital, it'd be operating, and then the operating budget of the city of New York is going down every year. Right. And in terms of the choices that the mayor makes and the council make, this would obviously be something they chose not to fund. And so they had to come up with other ways to fund it. Right. And it literally wouldn't be a capital expense because it's you're... Capital is capital. It's building a building. Mm. This, is, this is operating. I see. The I guess... annual revenue, you'd have to appropriate it. So it'd be a choice of, are you going to fund an after-school program or are you going to fund cognitive behavioral therapy? And they chose, they, like they chose to do any sort of trade-off. Right. And they got pretty smart, I think, and pretty lucky to identify a set of people who are willing to figure out how to use private capital to pay for this public good. Got it. And... and Sure, go ahead. All right, I was just going to ask Liz. Um, one another sort of thing that occurs to me as a problem or or disincentive to this. Uh, this I'm sort of looking for problem in, in the sense, just to make sure we're looking at this um, all the way around is is this um, if these are ultimately to be you know become normalized in part of, and actually there's becomes a market for this, and, and rather than this program, you can kind of tell has lots of uh, 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 sort of, uh, uh, it's sort of a, a show program, and it has lots of sort of belts and suspenders and things that may not uh, be present. The investor is going to be looking for the safest of the safe, right? They want the thing that's going to pay. And the thing that bothers me about this is, if we, if the, if the cognitive behavioral therapy is so good, it's almost like a shame that um, that you're you're almost transferring the, not the risk but the benefit of something so 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 safe and so so effective from from the state, which could get the better. You know what I'm saying? And and, and to 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 the market, if 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 you catch. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's not it's not that safe. I mean, there's it's been it's been evaluated. Um, it has not been used, as far as I can tell, at this scale um, with this particular population, um, and smashed into such a very short time frame. So it's it's really scaling things that are proven. Um, so that there's an uncertainty about it. I mean, I certainly am a little bit nervous. Um, it's. And, but I, I, but where I kind of agree is that it, it, it's not probably the right mechanism for <coughs> funding innovation. And I don't know how you do that. I mean, it, in a traditional venture capitalist is going to invest, let's say you're gonna invest a million dollars, you'll put $200,000 into five different things and you'll figure three of them will fail and one of them will break even and one of them is just gonna be a takeoff success and that's how you're gonna make your money back. That's how venture capital worked. And social venture capital, someday I hope, would work similarly, where 
people would take those kinds of risks with something that's a good idea that maybe has not been completely evaluated, but where the, what they now call the contrafactual information, meaning the data that shows how much you would save, either in human cost or in economic cost, right. um, and then do that. So, you know, I think that, I think that, I mean, I happen to be one of those people that believe that it's the government's job to protect our streets and our borders, but they're not. And I think that was sort of their point is that they're, they're not investing in these kinds of programs. The fact that they told me don't say cognitive skills should tell it initially, right. should tell you that they were concerned that the public would think that this was being too nice. And this is our problem is, you know, we're not, this, we, we serve difficult folks who right. are not popular. Uh, this is part of, I guess, Bloomberg's idea about young men of color and trying to provide services in a world in which that's not so popular. So if somebody else takes the risk, and obviously somebody thinks that that's going to happen because the governor just put a hundred million dollars right. into the proposed budget for next year to support what they call pay for success intervention. So it does require a government partner. It's just that they're saying, I don't think the taxpayers are quite ready for this. And it has to be somewhere in between the, it's kind of risky. It's too risky for the taxpayers, but it's safe enough for gold. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm going to um, go to questions. I actually had one. Uh, all right. I'm not going to ask it because that's the kind of guy, that's the kind of moderator right I am. Or don't, don't forget your questions. I'm going to just kind of go, I'm going to go to whoever has the microphone. And I have, actually, I do have something I want to ask. Okay. Um, go ahead. I'm going to interrupt her from John Jay. Uh, the, you don't have a control group, but you do have what we call in research uh, usual care. So what happened before you instituted the program? So are you in a position to say what was going on with those kids in these same respects, uh, how, how they spent their time, or how much time they spent in anything called therapy, or in anything called school? Uh, that would be what's been happening before this intervention happened. Um, Vera believes that, uh, that they can do the right kind of matching to account for a number of things. That's not the only thing they're gonna to have to account for. They have to account for changes in arrest policy. If, if we suddenly stop, stop, and frisk. Yeah. I actually, you know, we it's an independent evaluation. What that seems to mean is that Vera doesn't talk to me about it. You'll have to ask. Uh, uh, <laughs> what did they do with the propensity matching? We're just, so we have four. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get you a mic next time you talk. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have the floor. Maybe one clarification. But you have to take it. Only if you say it into the mic. Use the mic. I'm Andy Phillips, also from Goldman Sachs, and spent the greater part of the last six months working on this. Um, a clarification on the point that was made in terms of why wouldn't the city just do this on on their own and reap all of the benefit. If um, Osborne hits their goal of a 20% reduction in recidivism, net of paying Goldman back $11.7 million, the city will have saved $20 million. <coughs> so that's to give you a sense of why this is still very, very good for the city. Thank you. Uh, Nick Dunkey, Chicago. Uh, what's in this for Goldman or for some other investment bank? Is this uh, goodwill, is this PR, or do you actually think there's a potential to make money out of these kinds of arrangements? Great question. I was gonna add one thing to that, is that is this part of actual Goldman's regular income statement? Is it actually part of the bank? Right. It's not part of a philanthropic arm. Yeah, yeah. Um, the answer to that question, I think, is yes, yes, yes. Um, I think it's mostly driven by, that's why I started with what our business is, because it's sort of counterintuitive that you would think that Wall Street banks are out investing in urban communities in general. 
Um, but it's absolutely not in the philanthropic part of Goldman. It's in, it's in our bank. Um, and again, in our view, it is absolutely the, the next natural step of any typical community development practice that is historically focused on, again, the built environment, which is solving one part of what are complex issues around why neighborhoods continue to struggle and why low and moderate income communities continue to struggle. To the extent that we can create financial instruments that allow us to deploy capital to work on these issues and get a fair return, a similar return to what we would get in any other type of community development investing, that is to us the natural evolution of what people are now calling basically social impact investing. So at the end of the day, um, the returns we get, whether we're building affordable housing or financing a public health care clinic, or a local small business, um, we are looking to add that you know, to our toolkit. Um, and yes, does it enhance the brand? I don't know, you tell me. I mean, is Goldman Sachs polling well? I, I don't think so. But I think that we, you know, I think that part of our challenge um, is to be thought leaders in using what are some pretty smart people who work with me to figure out how to develop these mechanisms that effectively allow the private sector to put their capital at risk um, to advance really important public policy agendas. And then it's up to the OMB directors to decide whether or not the city is gonna save enough money in the long run, right? I'm not counting the beans at New York City. The budget director decided, wow, I'm willing to pay, have pay Goldman Sachs up front and some modest return because at the end of the day, we're gonna <coughs> save a lot more money, right? It's that discussion around what the cost savings are. So, you know, to the extent that people here in this room think we're better by doing this, that's fine, but that's not what most people are going to think about at Goldman Sachs, but it is part of a broader, I think, legitimate effort by really smart people on Wall Street to bring what we have to bear, both our actual capital, which we have a lot more of in a lot of struggling jurisdictions, and our human capital of knowing how to structure these deals, which I think, as Liz pointed out, does perhaps lend a, although it can be quite cumbersome at times, a focus on measuring the results and really trying to determine whether or not these impacts are coming so that at the end of the day, maybe the public sector can make better arguments about why taxpayers should pay for this. But right now, she's not allowed at a, you know, at a press conference to use the word therapy. We have a lot of work to do, right? And we were willing to get on three days of therapy. We've all been in therapy. <laughs> um, question for Goldman Sachs. Um, so I think that that is, I think it's an important piece of the puzzle of bringing private capital, you know, to, to address these challenges. I just want to add that you, you may notice in your program, we originally were going to have another panelist here, Navjeet Bell from Nixon Peabody up in Boston, who would have given us another dimension about how this is working in others. So we don't want to just um, uh, uh, focus on Goldman as the only um, uh, example of how this works, but uh, Navjit Bal in Boston is doing a similar program in New England and in Ohio, uh, which are getting the support of the DOJ, the Department of Justice. So it has gone already wider than just the city of New York. But it started in England. The whole thing started in England. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so to the point that.